have held me in your arms in my head I've been witness to your charms a thousand times You have sung me a love song in my head You're very welcome to the first episode of The Attic Sessions. My name is Nessa O'Mahony and I'm a writer and this is our attic. The man behind the camera is Peter Salisbury and he's a filmmaker and uh, my husband. And uh, we thought that we'd just like to invite people we really like and admire to come and talk about themselves and writing and cultural discussion about things that are current. So we are absolutely thrilled that our very first guest for the first episode of the Attic Sessions is Leah Mills. Leah, you're very welcome. Thank you, Nessa. And uh, the reason that we're so thrilled to have Leah here is that um, very soon you are going to be immersed in um, a whole event called One City, One Book, um, based on your novel Fallen, which was published, I think, in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, so it tells the story of a girl, Katie, who um, is living her life but gets inadvertently caught up in the events of the uh, Easter 1916 Rising, or, you know, part of it anyway. Um, so what did it feel like to hear that your book had been chosen as the one city, one book? It felt amazing, actually. I was thrilled. Of course, I was thrilled. But I was also asked to keep it quiet for a long time, so I didn't tell anyone. So when did you find out? I first heard, I think it was March. Of last year? Yeah. Gosh, a year to keep that secret. Yeah. Well, it was a long time. So there was a part of me that kept thinking they could still change their minds. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a million years. Not in a million years. And what... Does it mean something like that? When you've been spent a long time writing a book and you publish it, it gets an audience. Is there a whole new dimension that's added when somebody says, this is what we're going to do, we're going to construct this whole festival around it? Absolutely. I mean, the One City, One Book Festival happens every year and every year there's a different book with a connection to Dublin or the writer has a strong connection with Dublin and but really the festival is a celebration of reading and there's a whole series of events constructed that might have only the most glancing connection with the book that's actually being chosen um, it's an excuse for a party really but this year in particular I think because of the coincidence with the centenary and the commemorative events for 1916 the programme is actually huge. So it's mind-blowing, actually, the number of events that there are. And some of them really do have nothing to do with the novel. Um, but it's all part of the same festival and it's all in the same poster and on the same website and part of the same series of events. So it's huge. But it, it, it must be, you know, just, just to see people give their own take on something that you laboured long and hard over and, and it was a very personal thing, but suddenly it becomes public property. That must feel well, peculiar. In the same way that books only really come to life when they're read. You know, so all those hours that you spend on your own putting words down on paper, it requires a reader to come along and bring it to life. But a festival like this, I think, makes the story kind of burst outside the covers of the book mm -hmm. and, and acquire three dimensions mm -hmm. and be walking around. Um, and, and I think Dublin is going to be an amazing place to be in April. There'll be so much going on and nobody's going to be wearing ordinary clothes. Everyone's going to be dressed up and um, pretending. I've seen charity shops with uh, sort of like <laughs> Edwarding. There's in, in Terenur at the moment, the Vincent's shop in Terenur. Oh, has, I have to go there. Yeah, yeah have to go totally. there. Totally. So everybody has the opportunity to buy their volunteer outfit or something that looks like it. Can we go back a couple of years or longer? Because clearly you didn't write this book with one city, one book in mind. You wrote it for lots of reasons that I'd love you to talk about. I think the real origin of the novel happened in a very bizarre kind of existential moment when I was sitting in my car at the traffic lights at the bottom of Dominic Street coming onto Parnell Street. 
And you know the way your mind kind of idles when you're sitting at traffic lights like that? And it was really as if the city around me just receded and the older walls of the older city just rose up out of the ground for all of five seconds. And I realised that I was looking more or less exactly at the place where my mother was born over the shop in Parnell Street. And the lights changed and I drove away and it, for some reason it struck me really forcibly that she was a toddler in that family in Parnell Street at the time of the Rising with the whole British Army camped outside their door trying to burn the garrison out of the GPO and I just thought what would that have been like? And I had never thought about the Rising in that way before because our official narrative mm -hmm. is so carefully constructed and so polished that it was almost impenetrable to me before then. So it was like finding a secret entrance mm. at the back. Mm -hmm. And I knew, I filed the thought away, but I knew I'd go back to it. And so when was that? When did that actually happen? I don't know. I was trying to remember yeah. driving over here because I knew you'd probably ask me that question. And I just can't Had you remember. I know it was the other novels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't mean anything because they were a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I th well, I certainly published the first novel, but it was definitely more than 10 years ago because right. it was before I was ill. So about um, Another Alice? Another Alice came well, out in 1996. Mm -hmm. So it would have been later than that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe before Nothing Simple. Mm -hmm. So, and it's interesting because I was just watching yesterday um, Brandon O'Carroll, the comedian, did a one hour program about his family's 1916 experience because his father would have been a toddler in a house on Manor Street and the three older brothers uh, went into the GPO and they all actually survived. Um, but again, so he was sort of taking, you know, the family experience and being surrounded literally by the, the um, barricades of different types over the course of the week. Um, so it was an immensely personal experience for, you know, hundreds of families in Dublin. Yeah, I think, I, so far as I knew, my family had no connection to the Rising whatsoever. And it was the kind of thing my mother would never, ever talk about. And when you think about it, by the time she was six years old, she'd lived through the Rising, the War of Independence and the Civil War. Um, so I think her... She was one of those, whatever you say, say nothing mm. generation. And so it, it really was like a blank canvas that I was offered, mm -hmm. this thing that I knew nothing about. But it just made me think about the people who didn't have a direct connection to the rising or who didn't have an agenda. But I still didn't know that was the novel I was going to write. Mm. Um, so how did Katie Crilly's particular story develop? this young woman with a love life and a brother who had died in the war. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how Liam came about. I think originally I made a rational intellectual decision that there should be someone in the family who was away fighting at the front because that would make things more interesting in terms of conflicted loyalty and everything. But what happened was that I had a residency in the CCI in Paris. And when I arrived in Paris, it was the end of August and it was just after the anniversary of the liberation in Paris mm -hmm. at the end of the Second War, Second World War. So everywhere you went, there were flowers and memorials and plaques and signs saying, you know, this is where X number of people were killed. This is where X was taken prisoner. Um, and the graveyards in Paris, which I love to haunt graveyards, the graveyards are full of memorials to all kinds of different conflicts. And I thought, we have nothing like this. Mm. We have absolutely nothing like this. It's as if we have no connection with war of any kind. Mm. Um, so while I was in Paris, I began to read about Irish soldiers in the First World War. It was never my intention to write about that war. I knew nothing about it. I wasn't drawn to it in any way. But the more I read, the angrier I got on their behalf uh, because I just felt that they had been betrayed by absolutely everybody. The British betrayed them, our own government betrayed them and their own families couldn't 
really commemorate them in any mm. real way mm. mm -hmm. af after I think about 1919 mm. was maybe the last time. So, which would make sense because mm. mm -hmm. the War of Independence. Mm -hmm. um, so, Katie's character then really developed out of her grief for her brother. Because quite early on in the novel, Liam, it, it, the reports come home that he has died and yeah. in a very moving um, section in the novel. The uh, uniform comes back mm -hmm. um, and his, his possessions, his belongings. Um, so it's she's dealing with that level of emotion and then trying to come to terms with a, with a city that is l completely transforming around her because it's been pulverised out of, out of uh, recognition by conflict. Um, that was another thing, I think, before I began to do the research for this novel, I had no idea of the extent of the damage. It was a really strange thing. I had totally bought into that line of the 16 men who were executed as if those were the only people who died. Sure. And very early on, I realised that almost 500 people had died in a very short space of time in a very small area. Mm -hmm. uh, and 100,000 people had to go on relief after the rising because they had lost everything in the fires. And that was a third of the population of the city. So I think another really strong source for the novel was that when I was younger and loving the story of the rising as I knew it, and why wouldn't I? It's a great story. I always had this niggling unease about the received notion that Dubliners were hostile to the rising. And I used to think, but Dublin is where it happened. Mm. This is where everything happened. So why are people always down on Dublin? I really love this city and I get very bent out of shape when people just criticise everything about it. I think people use it and then just kind of despise it. Mm. Uh, so I get very defensive about that. Um, yeah, so that research kind of told me, well, yeah, if you were a Dubliner and you had just lived through all of that, you'd be pretty angry too at all the death and destruction that had been brought down around your head. Martial law had been imposed, and I don't know, mm -hmm. I should know how long it lasted, but, but uh, life the was The martial very law difficult. lasted long after the executions even. Yeah. 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 And I, one of the other things that's occurring to me as you're saying that is that for the longest time there was very little depiction of those times. So we either had the sort of the Sean O'Casey version, we had the, the James Stevens factual account, the insurrection in Dublin, um, the, the Strumpet City finished three years earlier, instead of, so it's 1913, but we don't really go beyond that. So um, I suppose that sort of raises the question about why there was such artistic reticence um, to actually describe it, to deal with it, to this this sort of cataclysmic, life changing series of e of events in Ireland, and yet Irish writers were not really writing about it. I think it was probably all still too raw or too contentious. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, people did write about it. Uh, Frank O'Connor wrote about it. Liam O'Flaherty wrote about it. Uh, there's a writer called Margaret Barrington who had a novel, My Cousin Justin, which oh, right. is set in and around that time. Um, and short stories. But I would say that was it. Maybe people were too conflicted mm. because everything turns sour so very quickly. Um, and the Civil War, I think, made it probably impossible to look at events objectively. Mm -hmm for a very long time. Mm, mm. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's a whole other area of discussion about, you know, mm -hmm. how are they going to try to commemorate the Civil War and what would you commemorate and what would you just sort of shove aside? Like, is anybody going to mention Bally CD or, or, you know? I think if you, if you, once you start, you have to keep going. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, Katie, was, was, was there a sense that, and again, we've been having a lot of, of, of uh, media discussion about the sort of the woman's role and whether it was underplayed or overplayed or, or whatever. Were you very deliberately wanting to explore the sort of the, 
the female perspective on all of this or, or was it that political for you? I wasn't aware of that. Um, you know that great Sam Goldwyn expression, if you have a message, send a telegram. <laughs> but, uh, but she was always going to be a female character, I think, at the centre of this. And I don't know why, but she was. Mm -hmm. And she was always going to be called Katie. Um, it was just such an incredibly interesting time for women. You know, the campaign for the vote and the campaign for the right to third level education and everything changing. And whenever you read about the period, it was so dynamic in terms of culture and even social activism, politics, whether it was nationalist or not, everything was changing. And it must have been an incredibly exciting time mm -hmm. when everything seemed to be opening up. And then once we got our independence, it all just seemed to close down again. Yeah, because you and I were both at an event in Cork a couple of weeks ago and you were talking about how the the visionary sort of egalitarianism of the proclamation just slowly got sort of undermined and undermined by legislation after legislation after legislation. And, you know, starting with the first coming of the Gale government and, 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 and reaching its height probably with uh, De Valera and, and the, the new constitution. Height or depth? Or depth. <laughs> Nady or, or Zenith and one of the things that I was wondering was was had you projected forward in your mind um, where Katie Crilly might be say in 1936 20 years later? Um, no I hadn't I hadn't I, certainly by the time I finished the novel um, I hadn't seen beyond it. Mm -hmm. Oh she's on the brink of lots of she is she's on the verge of lots of things when when the novel finishes so yeah i i suppose the question about katie and and where she might be in in 1936 leads me then to a more general thought about the actual women who were you know either in the gpo in 1916 or part of this sort of the different brigades or part of a kind of a social movement that looked like they could bring about real change in ireland yeah in many ways i'm actually more interested in that everyday kind of heroism and commitment that so many women had, so whether they were in the GPO or not. Um, Dr. Kathleen Lynn would be one of them, but a, a big hero of mine is Hannah Shee Skeffington um, and also Louis Bennett. Um, and, and all of those three women actually were very vocal in opposition to a series of repressive laws that were brought in um, initially by the Free State Government, but later by de Valera as well, indeed. For example, the constitution of the, the original constitution of the Free State Government in 1922 reiterated the maxim that men and women would be equal. But in 1927, we had the Juries Act, which exempted women from jury service. And at the time, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington argued really strongly against that law because she said that citizen requ citizenship required participation. Um, and she also pointed out that it meant that a woman couldn't expect to have a fair trial because she wouldn't be tried by a jury of her peers. Um, then you had in 1935, the Conditions of Employment Act that gave the minister industry and commerce I think it was at the time the right to restrict the numbers of women in employment you had the marriage bar mm. and then we had the Constitution in 1937 and I don't really know what happened why so many women let that pass mm. but I do think that one of the reasons was that there was such extreme poverty and hardship in the country um, we'd had an economic war with Britain people were struggling to survive and maybe that meant that there just wasn't energy left over mm. to be taking part in really dispiriting political battles. Mm. But women like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, Kathleen Lynn, Louis Bennett, they never stopped fighting, arguing and trying to promote that equality. After 
I think it was after the Conditions of Employment Bill, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington resigned from the executive of Fianna Fáil and she wrote a letter to the press saying that she wouldn't vote again until there was a truly independent political party in Ireland. That's an incredible statement mm. from a woman who went on hunger strike and was imprisoned for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things that I heard this week on, on the radio, um, Dermot Ferreter was talking about the women, um, some of the women who had been on active service it, during 1916 um, and who, how who found it very difficult to persuade the authorities later uh, that they were worthy of a pension simply because they were women. Uh, one one woman he mentioned, I think her name was Skilleter. Margaret Skilleter. Skilleter, who had come from Glasgow and was a sniper and who had been wounded. Injured, yeah. Um, and apparently the uh, debate centred on the fact uh, of whether you could call a soldier call a woman a soldier at all and that this uh, sort of um, system for compensation had been set up for soldiers. So if you couldn't call a woman a soldier, clearly she wasn't entitled to compensation, which just, you know, certainly this was the first time I'd ever heard that. I think it went even further. I think the medical officer who was asked to review her statement said that the definition of a wound could only apply to a man. Oh, for God's sake. There you go. It's 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 it, it's bonkers. But it's, it's only now bonkers. that we're hearing these yeah. stories because and and again the point was being made about just much greater access now to those uh, those statements, those witness statements that were in the the military archives. Actually, I don't agree with you okay. because I think the recovery of these stories started a long time ago uh, in the eighties, and there were a number of feminist historians who began the work. Uh, Margaret Ward's Unmanageable Revolutionaries, for example, her biography of Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, which is a great resource, uh, Rosemary Cullen Owens, Maria Luddy, all of these people. And there was even an exhibition in the Civic Museum in Dublin in 1991, where Maeve Ruan wrote a book called De Ten Dublin Women that researched basic facts about a lot of the women that we've talked about. Uh, and put them between the covers of a book. So they were known. I think it's a more interesting question how they got lost again and why people weren't interested enough to keep them at the forefront. Yeah. And I think it's a really trendy question at the moment. And we have the whole issue of waking the feminists. Sure. And I hear younger women saying, oh, it's great. Everything's going to change now. And I have this horrible old crone weary reaction where I think, oh, you're so young, you know. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. I think we have to achieve critical mass yeah. somewhere that we haven't quite got it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe at this point we might hear something from the book. Would that be possible to get a little reading? It's certainly possible. It would be lovely to. Yeah. Let me see. I think I will read a very short passage. This comes early on in the book. It's June 1915 and it's two months since the Crilly family heard that Liam was killed at the Second Battle of Ypres. Um, so this is the day that should have been their birthday and Katie is just resisting the whole thing furiously because she can't accept that she will ever get to be older than Liam will ever be. So here we go. Two months later, on the day that should have been our birthday, the longest day of the year, I spread Liam's letters out on the bed and reread them in the order they'd been written. I knew them off by heart. In January, not long after he went to the front, he'd sent a letter to mother full of certainty that he would come through the war unscathed. Half an hour ago, Jerry sent a storm of shells over I thought I was a goner. I heard a rumbling Mary come my way. That's a 17-inch shell, in case you don't know. But could I run or throw myself clear? No, I couldn't budge. You'll think I was afraid. But no, I was up to my knees in mud, gripped as tight as though someone poured a ton of cement on me. I stood there, braced for the worst, and the sound roared right on by. 
After all that, it was only a field ambulance I heard, straining along a track in high gear. The whole thing over in a flash, longer in the telling than in the happening. So you see, my life is charmed. There's no call to worry about me. Our last billet was blown to smithereens not long after we'd left it. That building was hundreds of years old. It's nothing but a mess of old rubble now, yet here I am, still in one ugly piece. I should have known better than to believe him. He was cheerful for our parents' benefit, knowing his letters to them would be read out loud as soon as they arrived and many times over. They were passed around Mother's sewing circle until the paper wore thin and the ink at the edge of the pages got smudged from too much handling. The letters he wrote to me were darker, meant for my eyes only. A shadow fell on them and deepened as the wet, bitter winter dragged on. So what next for you now? What next for me? After the Two Cities One book? Oh, and we didn't even mention the Two Cities One book because not only is Fallen the One City One book in Dublin, but this year there's a new thing called Two Cities One book. So yeah. do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I'm really excited about that. I think that is the thing that I'm most delighted about is the cooperation between Libraries Northern Ireland and Dublin City Libraries for the festival. So there's a whole programme of events in Dublin. There's a whole programme of events in Belfast. But um, one of the things that they're doing is that book clubs in Dublin have been twinned with book clubs in Belfast. And their initial meeting is through Reading Fallen and they're going to have sponsored encounters where they talk about the books but the connection between the book clubs is going to continue after the festival is over. Oh, super. So I just love that all of that cooperation and dialogue is starting up and it's starting with Fallen. And Belfast was a very different place in April 1916. Mm, I think different. the, the um, various Ulster brigades in, in the France had been through a very bloody conflict and a lot of people had been lost already so I'd say there must have been horror. Um, well that was no different from Dublin. Yeah. I mean the, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers lost so many men, the Royal Irish Rifles, the Irish regiments, one of the reasons that I said that the British government betrayed them, their own army betrayed them because increasingly as the war went on those regiments were diluted and disbanded and broken up because it was as if the Irish soldiers weren't trusted anymore, whereas there would have been no question of that before 1916. Um, one of the things that I found out during the course of my research, or one of the things that I realised was that the Rising actually began on the 24th of April, the anniversary of two major engagements that took the lives of hundreds of Irish soldiers. One of them was the Second Battle of Ypres mm. and the other was the landings in Gallipoli. Um, actually, I, I think I'd like to read a paragraph about that. Please, if I can. please do. Just to make sense of it. This mm. is a little bit further on from uh, the passage that I just read earlier. This is Katie again thinking about Liam on their birthday. Grief made fools of us all. There was shock in it, but there could hardly be surprise. A young man goes off to war. What do we expect of him? What did we think would happen? For me, belief in a personal, all-knowing, all-seeing God had already become impossible in the face of what was happening on the continent. There had been shocking casualties in the Dublin regiments alone. Thousands dead. We'd heard that in the Dardanelles, Many of the Dublins were put off their boats into water that was too deep for them. Pulled under by the weight of their packs, they drowned, while Turkish bullets and mortar fire tore into their comrades and churned the sea red. The gas unleashed at Ypres around the time that Liam died was still claiming lives two months later. Every second person on Sackville Street wore a black armband or a cuff. It, it really is a thing that we have forgotten is the extent of the casualties across the whole island. It wasn't just the Ulster Brigades sure. and the Battle of the Somme. Tom Kettle, who I mentioned earlier, was killed. Mm. 
mm -hmm. in the psalm within six months of the executions. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, as you say, it is just something that I suppose apart from honourable exceptions recently, like Sebastian Barry and, and Alan Monaghan, it just hasn't hasn't been written about. Um, so so wonderful to think of a an actual focus that brings the two cities probably most involved in that conflict in Ireland together for that. So then after all that, so mad April. Mad April. Mad April. Brilliant um, April. Great then, fun April. Then you go to an island summer and, and drink <laughs> rum for a while and then and then what happens next? Then I have a heavy date with my keyboard. I have to get back to work. Do you Looking know forward to that. do you know what you are going to be working on? Yes. And you probably don't want to share that. No. Superstitious thing. Well, it has been a huge pleasure to talk to you, to have you as our first guest. Um, Thank you for asking me. Not at all. I, it's going to be an amazing six weeks or so. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk about all the other things that you've been doing because you've been in Farmley as their writer in residence and organising extraordinary events there. I know you're in UCD this year, so it is 2016 is an amazing year for you. So can we wish you the very best of luck? Can't wait to see what you're going to work on next. And uh, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks a million. So this is uh, the first episode of what we hope to be a monthly video podcast. Um, thanks again very much to Leah Mills for, for coming and sharing our attic space. We'll be back in about a month's time talking about other uh, issues of goodness knows what, whatever strikes our fancy. Uh, but thanks for listening and talk to you again soon. Yes, I know That I'm just a dreamer I dream Cause it's the closest I'll ever get to